Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are finally getting around to covering Deceased at World's End number four. As you guys know, from what we talked about in the past, the Deceased line of, or really the, the Hope at World's End line of comics take place during the main Deceased stories. I'm still not sure exactly how we're going to place these in terms of the chronology in relation to the other DC stories as far as like a playlist or something like that, but I'll figure it all out and I'll make sure that I have that set up for you guys. Um, I do have a playlist down in the description for all the DC stuff if you wanna kind of follow along as we're as we're covering all this. But what this does is this initially picks up with a couple of different things. The first is a place called Jotunheim and the second is the Eerie as well as Wink. Now, Jotunheim is a it's really kind of like a, a building or a fortress of sorts that was made in DC Comics that was made during World War II by the Germans. But the idea is that it's designed to be a fortress that's virtually impenetrable. And for the most part, it is, right? You've got a little tiny door down at the bottom that you can use to access it. But aside from that, there's no real conceivable way to break in there through traditional means. Now, as far as the Eerie and Wink go, these are two exceedingly new characters. Eerie and Wink first appeared in Suicide Squad Volume 6, Issue Number 1 in February of this year, in 2020, and we don't really know anything about them. It's kind of weird. Eerie refers to itself as like it, right? Doesn't really call himself like I or or like him or she. So I don't know, like it's, it's kind of, it's, it's almost referred to as if Eerie is like two people combined into one, but Eerie and Wink are basically just kind of together here. Now, the fact that Tom Taylor includes these characters in here as part of what's going on with Deceased is really, I think, nothing more than a kind of advertised characters that he has going on in Suicide Squad and to kind of be like, hey guys, like if you want to see more of these characters, check out Suicide Squad. I can't really think of much much reason why you would see them there in this, but the long and short of this is that with Eerie's ability to fly, that he's really just kind of been moving moving them in a particular location, but you've also got Wink who has the ability to teleport. Now, the reason why I think Wink's not really teleporting too much is it seems like there's a kind of limitation here and it makes sense in the sense that Wink seems to have the ability to teleport, but only to places that she's either seen or she understands the layout of. Now, if as soon as they get to where Jotunheim is, they're immediately set upon by fire, right? Like they literally just start, start getting shot at all over the place. Now at that point, Wink teleports and then re-teleports them inside of Jotunheim itself and then immediately calls for a ceasefire. And that, that, it's kind of intriguing because on the surface, you kind of have this idea that like these guys are kind of in effect, quote unquote, villains. But the reality of this is that if you guys are following Deceased, you've got heroes out there who are incredibly powerful, who have been infected, right? So it's one of these things where like anybody who's not here is gonna be treated as a bad guy. It's the safest thing to do. That's how you keep people safe. Because as soon as you start letting people in, you're going to let the wrong ones in, right? You're going to let infected people in. And there goes your entire base of operations. Hard times require hard decisions. And so from here, we basically end up jumping over to the Fortress of Solitude, right? Now, this takes place before Damien officially takes on the mantle of Batman. And in fact, the suit has just been given to him by Alfred. And this is not something that we got to see a whole lot of. And even here, we don't really get to see a whole lot of it. It's only, you know, one or two pages. But it's Damien Wayne just kind of struggling with the idea of, of taking on the mantle of Batman, right? Because for all the vaunted pride of Damien and all that kind of stuff, the idea of what Batman means and what it represents was not lost on him. Sure, he had like a rough relationship with his dad, right? I mean, Damien kind of grew up and was, was, was taught to be a, a cold-blooded killer. And then when he was handed over to Bruce Wayne, Bruce Wayne tried to ease some of those sharper edges Damien had. And it certainly led into a whole lot of bumping of heads between these two guys. But by and large, Damien understands the notion of what it means to be Batman, the responsibility that comes with taking on such a man. And so does Jonathan, right? Jonathan kind of makes that, makes that, makes this comment, you know, the symbol doesn't exactly come free of burden. When you take on that symbol, when you take on that mantle, you take on all the responsibility that comes along with it. And so we get this really cool moment here in a second, but before we do, I want to switch back over to Wink and to the Eerie, because basically you end up having just like Manticore, who's the guy with the lion's head. He's kind of a weird character. You had Manticore way back in the day in the old Ostrander Suicide Squad stories. He was part of a group called Jihad. He was never really that important. And then you have him now and he's still not important, but... <laughs> He's in this story, right? So I guess it serves some kind of a purpose, but basically says that if the agreement of Wink and, and the Eerie was that we'll help you if you guys need it, as long as you give us quarter, then he comes in and basically says, now's the time for your help, right? We had two members of our team who basically went to scout to the West. They haven't returned. Go look for them. Let's we'll see if you can't figure out what it was that happened to them. Either they've become infected or they're just stranded out there somewhere and they're looking for rescue. Whatever the case is, we need answers from you. And so despite the Eerie having virtually no sleep, he ends up jumping in and, and doing what needs to be done. And so at this point, we switch over to Superman and this is where 
where Tom Taylor really shines. Tom Taylor is one of these writers where he's so remarkably good at focusing on characters, capturing characters the way they're supposed to be, and then giving them to us in these ways that are exceedingly interesting, right? It's why the story of uh, of Injustice Gods Among Us was so good is because it didn't have anything to do with like Superman becoming a bad guy, Batman becoming a, a rebel fighter or anything like that. It was the breakdown of the characters, why they were doing what they were doing. Tom Taylor was exceedingly good at that. And that's what we end up getting here with Damian Wayne. Damian Wayne's initial question for, for Superman is like, shouldn't you be out there? And his response is, yeah, but like Jonathan wanted me to come in here and he said this was more important. And so it's kind of cool because they have this, this interesting conversation, right? Superman says that, that Bruce Wayne believed that Damien deserved this, right? It's not something that Damien was just given because of the fact that there is no Batman, Damien's the only real Robin left, and so he just gets the suit because there's just no other options. Damien's getting it because Batman wanted him to have it. And it's one of these things where Damien says, well, Bruce wasn't always right. Uh, the response of a Superman is, well, you know, of course not. I mean, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. But when we're kids, we don't understand what it is that our fathers are trying to teach us. It's only when we grow older that we begin to understand what it was that they were saying. And it's like that in life, right? Like for our parents, right? Girls, moms tell their daughters, don't go after the Batman bad boys and the daughters do it anyway then they grow up and realize yep their moms were right fathers tell their sons don't go after the easy girls right like you're gonna get nothing but problems there right and it's kind of like whatever pops you don't know what you're talking about they grow up then they realize that's right you see that in all manner of different different ways don't chase the easy money go for things that work hard expand your possibilities get out there and live we get all these different explanations from our parents about how it is that we should live our lives in the most effective way possible and for the most part we have a tendency when we're younger to kind of blow them off because they don't know what they're talking about or they're from like a body gone era, things have changed, whatever the case is. But then as we grow up and as we become adults, we come to this realization that they're right. They were instilling in us the wisdom as best that they could offer, and they weren't entirely wrong. And that's one of the things that Superman basically tells to, to Damian Wayne, that yes, your father wasn't always right, but your father was trying to help you become the best version of yourself. And because of that, if he, if he believed that you deserved to have the Batman mantle, then he was right about that, right? It was his, it was his call. He was Batman. He decides who becomes the best person and he decides who that person's going to be based on what it is that he knows. Now, the other part of this, and this is what's kind of interesting here, this is a question you have to ask, what if Damien had died? <laughs> I could imagine that conversation with like with Dick Grayson. Here you go, Dick Grayson. Here's a Batman suit. It's like, man, Bruce Wayne really wanted me to have this. Well, no, he really thought Damien was the one who should have it, but Damien's dead. So like you, you get to have it now because, you know, I mean, there's no other option at this point. It'd be kind of disheartening. <laughs> It'd be a pretty disheartening conversation, but still Damien's biggest struggle here with regards to putting on the Batman suit is the fact that if he does, if he dons the mantle of the Batman suit, if he puts it on, he attaches all the gear, he goes through that whole process and he's officially recognized as Batman man, that it means one absolute and irrevocable truth. Bruce Wayne is gone. There's no means for him to come back. And it's one of these things where it's not tied to his suit. It's just this realization. The truth of this is that Bruce Wayne is gone, right? Bruce Wayne is not going to come back, right? There's no indication that Bruce Wayne somehow survived or anything like that. One of the first things that was done in Deceased is Bruce Wayne was killed, right? You guys remember that? Issue number one, Bruce Wayne's dead. And it was kind of mind blowing at the time because our experience with regards to Batman and plot armor is that, well, he'll find a way to live because, you know, it's Batman. He always makes it out, but he didn't. And it was awesome to see a story and what a story can be if Batman doesn't make it, right? Like it really kind of lends credence to the idea that Batman doesn't need to be the focal point of every major story that we see. But it's one of these things that Damien's kind of struggling with. And at the end of the day, Superman's response is the world needs a Batman. There are people out there who are struggling. There are people out there who are having a hard time of it, right? Who are literally fighting for their lives. Your father became a superhero because of the fact that he lost people that he cared about. You're in this same boat. You lost someone that you cared about, multiple people that you care about. It's your chance to become a hero, to step into that role and to continue the legacy of Batman. And so as this suit begins to get put on, Damien's kind of nervous about it. He's like, it doesn't quite feel right and so on. There's a couple changes that are made here and there, but then he full on becomes Batman. And so effectively, Batman has now returned. And so what we do is we end up jumping back directly to Wink and to the Eerie. And the idea here is, of course, they're basically scouting, right? The Eerie kind of looks around and, and so on. And when he's asked by Wink what it is that you see, the Eerie looks forward and basically sees this enormous army, right? Measuring in what appears to be the hundreds of thousands that are all being led by a man who flies. And as Eerie gets a better view, we end up finding out this is Black Adam. The Black Adam being infected is now leading the anti-life army. It's pretty cool, right? Like the anti-life army rises here. This is awesome because immediately the Eerie panics, right? He basically goes back to Wink and he's like, we've got to warn Jotunheim. We've got to get back there, tell them what's going on. There's an army of undead coming here. And Black Adam is more than enough to bring this entire facility crashing down. If we don't leave, we're going to die. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to 
to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.